Okay, welcome to uh, part two of Senate Finance for May 18th, May 16th. What day is it? May 16th. See, I'm trying to hurry this along. All right, I would like to welcome uh, the committee and would the committee secretary please take the roll. Senator Canazaro, Senator Goykachia, Senator Harris. Senator Neal, Senator Wynn, Senator Severs Gansert, Senator Titus, and Chair Dondero Loop. Here. And please mark those present as they arrive. Um, we have people who are in and out. So, with that, um, we will start with Senate Bill 36. And. Uh, <clears throat> On behalf of the Attorney General, oh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. All right, please go ahead when you're ready. And we like short and sweet around here, so thanks. Thank you so much for the record, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford, Teresa Benitez Thompson, thank you so much for the consideration of this hearing on Senate Bill 36 today. Uh, just quick and to the point, um, what uh, 30 bill, Senate Bill 36 addresses is um, a gap of existing law. So existing law provides that a person who solicits a child for prostitution is guilty of a felony pursuant to NRS 201.354. However, the crime is not listed as a sexual offense anywhere within the Nevada revised statute. Therefore, the existing law does not require or allow for psychosexual evaluation to be ranged prior to sentencing. Um, the psychosexual evaluations are important tools. Um, there's a couple of different tools that can be used and both of them really help to assess and determine an individual's risk and likelihood of recidivism. And so um, the fiscal notes are coming from section two of the bill to allow the division of parole and probation to prepare psychosexual evaluations as part of the pre-sentence investigation report at the joint agreement of the prosecution and defense in situations where the defendant has entered a plea to a felony or gross misdemeanor that is not a sexual offense. Um, and the proposed bill is necessary to allow for the valuations to be ordered even when a defendant does not plead to a sexual offense because solicitation of a child for prostitution and the underlying facts of the case is involved an individual seeking to purchase sex from a minor, and this is a crime where an evaluation should be ordered. We have no objections to the fiscal note. We know that these evaluations cost money. We, we know that we have about 12 of these a year through our office, so the guesstimates of 24 a year's draft in the fiscal note are absolutely uh, appropriate. We take no, uh, we have no concerns with the fiscal note other than it is, um, we know a, a dedication of precious state resources. Thank you very much. Any questions on this bill? Uh, Senator Titus. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Uh, just a real quick question. Um, providers doing these assessments, any delay in the treatment, do you, do you anticipate it not, their process not being delayed because of them scheduling the evaluations? Uh, thank you so much for the record, Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff. Um, that might be a question better for parole and probation. I think if the funds are allotted, then it's certainly the fiscal capacity is there. In terms of the professionals who are, who are doing those, um, that might be a better question for, for them to answer versus me to kind of just presuppose. That's great, we can do that offline. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Any additional questions from the committee? All right, thank you very much. And with that, we'll go to support of Senate Bill 36 here in Carson City. Las Vegas, on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. If you would like to testify in support of SB 36, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time.
Okay, if you are listening, there is a new meeting ID of 820-1931-6015 for this particular meeting. So um, they have reposted the agenda with the new meeting ID. So if you are one of those people listening online, please make sure that you are dialing in on the right um, meeting ID. And with that, we'll go to opposition for uh, Senate Bill 36 here in Carson City in Las Vegas. On the lines, BPS, when you're ready. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll go to neutral here in Carson City in Las Vegas on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Any closing comments? Ms. Benitez Thompson. Okay, with that, uh, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 36 and I'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 107. Senator Daly. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is uh, Skip Daly, representing the Senate District 13 for the red record. Uh, Senate Bill 107 uh, establishes a program where uh, the Department of Transportation can <clears throat> utilize uh, out of service uh, highway patrol cars uh, and establish the program where contractors, if there are no actual law enforcement agencies available, uh, for them to use a non working uh, vehicle marked with the uh, marked as a highway patrol car uh, with working lights, um, but otherwise inoperable <clears throat> to try to increase uh, safety on road construction projects. Uh, my understanding is the uh, fiscal note came in actually late. I didn't know about it for, for some time through the Department of uh, Safety. Uh, and I know that we're working on trying to eliminate the uh, fiscal note on that. Uh, there were some exceptions on whether or not uh, they would be appropriate. My understanding was it was going to be withdrawn, but if it hasn't been yet, we're still working on it. Okay, thank you very much. So it sounds like this bill still needs just a tad bit of work. Is that correct? Is that what I just heard you say? Yeah, no, the, the bill is in the appropriate manner, so it, it's, it's ready to go. Uh, we're just trying to get the fiscal note resolved. I know I've been talking with the AGC. I told them <coughs> and they've been talking with the governor's office and the Department of Public Safety. Uh, my understanding that it was uh, taken care of, uh, but when I looked online this morning, the fiscal note's still there. Uh, we can argue order if, if we need to, but uh, my understanding was that it was going to be withdrawn. Okay. All right. Well, we're not voting on the bill today, so that works. We have any questions on this bill? Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just one question in the bill. It says the vehicle would be rendered inoperable. It, it seems to me that it would be he should at least be able to drive it to and from or move it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Skip Daly again for the record. Um, that was one of the uh, concessions that we made to the Department of Public Safety over the, uh, the bill was their concern that someone would be able to get into it, steal it, and go for a joyride in an otherwise operable <laughs> uh, highway patrol car. Uh, so the contractors uh, agreed if they were able to use that, they would tow it. And there's a variety of ways to disable the vehicle. I know in the fiscal note, they talk about having to pull the drive chain out. You can just disconnect the drive lines. You can take the spark plug wires up. There's a lot of ways to disable it without the <coughs> expense that's contemplated in the fiscal note. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And, and my concern was... Uh, sort of twofold. One of my concerns was is that a car with lights would be on the road while I recognize the um, safety hazards of our um, people that work on the side of the roads. My concern was that somebody would need a police officer, see that vehicle, and think it is a police officer. And when they stop, that is not a police officer. And now, for whatever reason, 
not only if they delayed getting help, but someone could be following them and they would not have the help and they would be stopped. So that was one of my concerns. Uh, also my concern is, is as I understand it, um, the lights are very often repurposed on a new vehicle where um, other parts of the vehicle may not be rendered um, usable or there are too many miles on it. The lights are not that way. So um, I had a few concerns about this. So we'll work on the um, fiscal note if that, or if that is or is not removed. Um, like I said, while I understand the, the need for this for our workers on the highway, um, I don't know. I watch people blow by me many times on the highway and they don't care that the police officer has somebody else stopped on the side of the road. So unless the vehicle's moving and they think they're gonna get stopped, they just blow right past it. So um, we'll keep working on this. And if there are no more questions from anybody else, uh, Senator Titus, I sort of saw you look. Did you have a question or a comment? Okay, okay, if, if all right. Just Go ahead. And, and try to answer answer your question. So we did make uh, several of those concessions in regarding the lights being repurposed. Um, the uh, contractors have agreed to pay uh, for whatever the cost for however many uh, cars might be available. So that part of it is is going to be addressed uh, on that. Either they'll buy them new lights or uh, pay, you know pay the difference. <clears throat> And we did also make the concession to, to your concern. A lot of times when there are live highway patrol, uh, if an officer is available, which isn't all that often, they're parked <clears throat> inside of the lane closure. And I understand that somebody still may uh, stop on that, but generally they're inside the lane closure. They're not just on the side of the road uh, out there. And they can only be there, uh, one of the concessions, when workers are actually uh, on the highway. It's not there to protect property or anything else, only when workers are actually present. So I'll go back to uh, Senator's question. Then if these vehicles are rendered undrivable, how does that vehicle get moved when there aren't workers there? So if the workers, many times freeway, freeway work is done in the evening, especially in Las Vegas, on some of the busier freeways, they'll do it in the evening when there isn't so much traffic, or it may be because they have to have a certain amount of um, a certain temperature to lay asphalt or whatever it is. Um, I know just enough to be dangerous about that. So being former chair of transportation. So with that being said, when they pull that car over and the workers are there, now the workers aren't there, what happens to the car? Uh, thank you again, Skip Daly for the record. Um, it from my understanding, talking with DOT and the contractors, <clears throat> that's gonna be contained within the permit of that they'll get from DOT in order to have the, use the vehicle. So the contractors will tow it out to the location and then when work, workers are leaving, they'll tow it back uh, and store it in the yard uh, uh, in a secure area. Okay. And, and I, while I recognize my safety concern may seem, I don't know, once in a while, I have three daughters, I have three granddaughters, and I've taught everybody as I've gone along, if you ever feel unsafe, you find a safe place to stop or go to. And so that's why I say, if I'm driving along the road and I feel unsafe for whatever reason and I pull over and that's not a police officer, I'm in trouble. So um, we have had things happen right here in this building, right? So um, we always look to our police officers as a safe place. And so um, once again, while I recognize the safety of our highway workers is important, um, I would never want anyone um, to feel unsafe thinking that it's a police officer because they help keep us safe in this building and out on the roads. So thank you very much for indulging me and letting me get on my soapbox for a minute. All right, with that, uh, seeing no more um, concerns or questions, uh, we'll go to support. 
of Senate Bill 107 in Carson City. Good morning. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Alexis Motorex representing the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors representing commercial construction in Northern Nevada. Um, thank you very much for hearing the bill today. I do apologize, I came running in late. I wasn't expecting it to be quite this early in the day. Um, so I missed the, the first part of the conversation, but um, Senator, da Senator Daly introduced this bill. Um, at our request, we've had several near misses, some fatalities, um, and, and there are real safety concerns on highways for our crews working out there. We feel that having a, a, a disabled car with the lights flashing will serve to s slow traffic down by the time they realize that, if they realize that nobody is in the car, um, they will have slowed, it will have worked, lives could have been, or lives will have been saved. Um, your question about, um, it just, left my brain. It's okay. We're all in your boat. That's why we're here at 11 o'clock in the morning instead of 11 o'clock at night. I was expecting 11 o'clock at night, to be quite honest. Um, but we would love to work through any concerns that you have. We feel that we've addressed several already that have been brought up by Department of Public Safety and other members. So we will continue to work through, but we would really love to see this bill move. and. Um, and make our crews a little safer on the roads. Thank you. And I, I appreciate that because I've watched near misses myself. So um, especially down there by the airport, holy smokes. So anyway. Um. <laughs> and uh, Alexis Motorex, Nevada Chapter Associate General Contractor, I did remember what I was gonna say. If somebody were to pull over thinking that that was an occupied vehicle and, and that there would be law enforcement there, again, this is would only the lights would be flashing, the car would be there only when crews are present, so there would be people there available to help. It wouldn't be law enforcement, but it wouldn't be that somebody has pulled over um, and then would just be on the side of the road by themselves. There would, there would be crews present. They all have um, methods of communication, so. Thank you very much. All right, anyone else in support here in Carson City? Seeing none, I don't believe there's anyone in Las Vegas. Uh, we'll go to the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. We'll go to opposition here in Carson City. Seeing none in Las Vegas. We'll go to the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. We'll go to neutral here in Carson City in Las Vegas, on the phone lines, BPS when you're ready. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, with that, um, any closing remarks, Senator? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 107. And I will, Senator Daly, I'm, Senator Daly, do you, do you mind if I go to your next bill and that will get Senate Bill 274. We'll jump to that and get Senator Daly done and then we'll go to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Again, Skip Daly representing Senate District 13. Uh, so on this one, actually, you should have some information in your uh, packet or up on Nellis, at least I hope I sent it out. So anyway, SB 274 in section three establishes a timeline for the processing and determination of a violation if there's a complaint filed. Uh, section one requires the administrator, uh, the Division of Industrial Relations to post on their internet website certain information of a person found in violation of the workman's compensation laws under 616 D 120. Uh, section two increases the benefit penalty uh, to not less than 17,000 from 5,000 and not greater than 120,000 up from, uh, from 50,000. In the amendment, and you do have an amendment uh, there in front of you, it was pointed out to me by the uh, uh, Division of Industrial Relations 
that when we changed the timeline in subsection three, we needed to change and update some of the appeal process provisions, so that's what we did. So in the amendment in front of you, it makes timeline adjustments for the appeal process in section one, subsection two, B, and section two, subsection four, section four, subsections one, two, and seven to conform with the changes in section three. Uh, in section four, subsection upholds the imposition of a benefit penalty. Section four, subsection eight makes it clear that if an insurer enters into a settlement agreement regarding a benefit penalty case, that the insurer must pay directly to the claimant the amount agreed to not later than 15 days after the date is stipulated in the settlement agreement. Uh, section four, subsection nine allows the commissioner of insurance to potentially suspend any certificate issued by the commissioner if an insurer fails to timely pay the benefit penalty and then section five and six address the effective dates of the bill. <clears throat> in regard to the fiscal note, uh, on April 27, 2023, the Department of Business and Industry Division of Industrial Relations submitted a revised fiscal note for a total of $197,550. Uh, it's my understanding that the fiscal impact does not directly impact the state budget because the way Workman's Comp is funded is through an assessment paid directly by the insurers. Uh, in any event, the bill is designed to get the uh, Workman's Comp people paid under the provisions to keep the promise to get their insurance. The increase in the penalties and the notice to the uh, insurance commissioner is designed to reduce the number of benefit penalty cases. That's our intent. That's what we're hoping will be the effect, which would also not, hopefully not require the division to have to hire any more people to take, uh, take care of those. Time will tell, uh, but again, I believe the fiscal note is paid by the insurers through the assessment. It doesn't affect the budget. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions or comments on this bill? Senator Ganser. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So you just thought mentioned that you thought the number of um, issues would go down instead of up with this? Uh, that, that's what we're hoping for. The original bill uh, would have provided a bad faith right to sue. So we, we walked back from that. Uh, we knew that was gonna be difficult as well. So we did increase the benefit penalty. <clears throat> the other thing that's included in there is if you get the benefit penalty and it's upheld, it will be posted on the website. And that when an investigation is started after a complaint, uh, the division is gonna be required to notify the insurance commissioner, uh, which will also put then people on notice and various things. So I think there will be a greater incentive to make sure that the insurers are paying the claims, not trying to uh, get out of uh, or, or not take care of injured workers, uh, which I do believe the incentive and the direction that we're trying to go will reduce the number of cases. That's what our hope is, uh, and uh, that's the way we designed it. Um, Senator Daly, uh, none of us have this amendment. Is this a verbal amendment or a written amendment? We, none of us have it. I sent it to Wayne in an email a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> It's okay, if Wayne's made one mistake this entire session, this might be the one he should make, I don't know. It, 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 but anyway, Skip Daly again for the record, uh, Madam Chair. It is a written amendment, it's a mock-up, I had LCB writing. Have you sent it to any of us? I sent it to Mr. Thornley yeah, I'll, I'll, and to Lona the other day. I can get it to you. I do not believe Lona has it. I sent an email to Mr. Thorley and he responded back and said, thank you, so. Is it the one page, this Wayne Thorley for the record, the amendment to section four that changes the days 
the failure to respond within 90 days, it changes that to 120 days. Is that the correct amendment that I'm looking at, Senator? Excuse me, again, Skip Daly again for the record. The amendment is uh, number 3645 to Senate Bill 274, and I believe it's a mock-up uh, submitted by LCB and it's nine pages. But it just changes the timeline uh, on the appeal process. And we spoke with the chamber, with uh, uh, various stakeholders, uh, gaming and the rest of them, and uh, they're all aware of uh, the amendment and are in agreement. Found it? The two billion emails. All right, we are going to look at that amendment. We might have to have part two of this. So um, if no one has any questions right this minute, um, we'll go to support of Senate Bill 274. And seeing none, Las Vegas, support for 274. Phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. If you would like to testify in support of SB 274, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. We'll go to opposition. Senate Bill 274 here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, on the phone lines, BPS when you're ready. If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 274, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. And then we'll go to neutral here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, BPS on the phone lines. If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 274, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. And with that, closing comments, Senator? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, the beginning again, Skip Daly representing Senate District 13. Uh, sorry for the confusion. The amendment is a technical correction. This uh, bill, we went through several um, meetings, iterations, we did get gaming, chamber, the self-insured groups, uh, all to a point where nobody's exactly happy, uh, but they all agreed uh, that this uh, was a step in the right direction. And uh, the bottom line is we're trying to make sure that injured workers uh, get their claims paid rather than having to resort to penalize uh, employers for doing the wrong thing or insurers, excuse me, because it's the insurers more than, than uh, direct employers. Uh, and the amendment is pointed out by the division, which they asked for to make technical corrections. Other than that, it doesn't change the bill, but uh, appreciate uh, you guys going forward. Hopefully we can get this amended and out of here. Uh, and the fiscal note, as I said, is paid through the assessment. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, uh, we will close the hearing on that and open the hearing on Senate Bill 143. And this will be Senator Neal. When you're ready, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Senate. Committee on Finance. Um, I'm Senator Dina Neal here to briefly present SB 143. So three things in this bill. One, it creates substantial compliance with HUD. 
Um, two, it creates fair chance housing um, by eliminating, well, narrowing the population that basically would be um, included in this bill, which was an amendment that was adopted that basically only applies to folks that are um, have been acquitted, granted parole, or otherwise exonerated, or has served their sentence, or has been released. The fiscal note on this bill is from Dieter. Um, they have a fiscal note for one, they need a compliance investigator, a supporting legal assistant, and they also have a technology expense on this. Um, I did talk to Dieter. They said that the um, fiscal note could not be amended. There was a second fiscal note that came in, I think, yesterday or today from the Attorney General, and I was able to work with the Attorney General because I found out about it this morning that if I change the section in the bill and section 15, page 7, line 23, and change the Attorney General to a may versus a shall, that I can um, get that unsolicited fiscal note removed. And with that, I'll open myself up for questions. Thank you very much. Any questions regarding this bill of Senator Neal? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. We'll go to support here in Carson City, Las Vegas, on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, we will go to opposition here in the Carson City here in Las Vegas and on the phone lines. BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. We'll go to neutral here in Carson City, Las Vegas, on the phone lines. BPS, when you're ready. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you very much. Any closing comments, Senator Neal? All right, with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 143, and we'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 145. And Senator Lang, welcome to Finance on the Run. Good morning, Chair. <clears throat> For the record, I'm Senator Roberta Lang, representing Senate District 7 in Clark County, and I'm here to talk to you about um, Senate Bill 145, which uh, talks about misclassification. In the 80th session of the legislature, uh, many of you were there and approved a work study group, a subcommittee to study misclassification in Nevada. Out of that subcommittee came recommendations, which is the bill that I brought forward this year. Um, why, why we're here in finance is the money that was from the fines was generally going into the general budget. We now need it, need it to be adjusted so it goes into the Office of the Labor Commissioner on um, Business and Industry. And uh, with that, I'll uh, rest my case. That's why we're here. Thank Perfect. You. I love it. Short and sweet. All right. Any questions for Senator Lang? All right. Seeing none, we'll go straight to support for Senate Bill 145 here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, and on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go to opposition of Senate Bill 145 here in Carson City, Las Vegas, on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, neutral here in Carson City in Las Vegas. Go ahead when you're ready, please. Good morning, Madam Chair. Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner. For the record, just wanted to be here to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Stay tuned just for a minute. Uh, anybody on the phone lines in neutral, please? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, closing comments, Senator Lang. Um, oh, there was one question, may we ask? We just need a clarification. Did you, I guess I'll let you sit down. Did you say there was an amendment? Okay. No. 
There, Madam Chair. Yes. There was an amendment. Um, I'm not sure if it has been amended into the bill yet, but it was um, prepared um, a long time ago um, for sec sec section three, subsection two. Is that what you're seeing? So, so this is already the first reprint that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So there hasn't been an amendment since then. Okay, just wanted the clarification because I wanted to make sure. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you for your time. All righty, I'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 145, and we'll go to uh, Senate Bill 166, and we will have Senator Pazina join us. Good morning, Chair Dendero, Loop, and members of the Senate Committee on Finance. For the record, my name is Julie Pizzina, representing Senate District 12 in Clark County. As the committee is aware, in 2019, the legislature approved Senate Bill 135, which authorized collective bargaining between the state and certain state employees, generally those in the classified system of employment. And this bill is seeking to help our first responders, um, including separate units of category one, two, and three peace officers, as well as firefighters take part in supervisory benefits. We did receive a fiscal note from the Department of Administration, Human Resource Management to manage these new supervisory units for first responders and have had many productive conversations since that fiscal note was shared with us. I will hand it over to Mr. McCann for any further comment. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please, Mr. McCann. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee and, and uh, staff. Rick McCann, Nevada Association of Public Safety Officers and a member of the Nevada Law Enforcement Coalition. Um, I got a lot of crap here, but frankly, uh, in the interest of time, because I don't want that look from some of you, um, here's what I want to say. Listen carefully. Um, with respect to the fiscal note, we've had a chance to speak with Ms. Bo Smith, who's back there and probably going to offer some comments as well. She's been extremely helpful. Uh, I think we may have come to some, some thoughts as to how to reduce this uh, fiscal note. However, this basically gets to, what, four new uh, bargaining units, one for category one, two, and three law enforcement, and one for firefighters. Normally, my understanding, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong, is HR looks at basically a ratio of two new uh, personnel analysts for every new bargaining unit. That's fine. What I want you to understand is right now the category one, two, and three law enforcement uh, rank and file people are already in bargaining units represented by unions and so are the firefighter, supervi uh, su uh, firefighter rank and file who are in unions bargaining units. So ultimately when we do bring these supervisors in, which there'll be a, a fewer number of, they're going to be absorbed essentially within the current unions that are already doing contract negotiations with the state. The state has become very good at this. They've done it now twice. I was fortunate enough and privileged enough to do the first contract for Category 2, uh, to, what, two, three years ago, uh, officers, and it was actually the first collective bargaining agreement for state employees in the entire state of Nevada history. We're very proud of that. They've gotten really good since then. They were good then. Um, and uh, we know what we're doing. I think under the circumstances, and again, Ms. Bosmith may come up here and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, leave, I believe we would all agree. They're good at doing it. They see the benefit of collective bargaining. It is working. It is becoming more efficient. So ultimately, I don't know that we need the ratio of two new personnel uh, uh, assistant threes for these two groups. I think that ultimately may be an overkill with all due respect to HR. And I believe that's one of the reasons why we think that this fiscal bill is more than it needs to be. But understanding that when you do take on more work, sometimes you need more people. We're not discounting that. We just think they don't need as many people as what has been represented within the fiscal note. And again, all the other crap, I'll keep out. Check. Thank you. All right. Any questions for uh, Senator Pazina or Mr. McCann? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go to those in support of Senate Bill 166. Um, Las Carson City, Las Vegas. On the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. We'll go to opposition here in Crescent City, Las Vegas. And on the phone line to BPS when you're ready. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll go to neutral here in Crescent City, Las Vegas. 
and on the phone lines. BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any closing comments, Senator Pizzina? Thank you very much. With that, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 166. One too, and we will go to Senate Bill 266 and click you off the list as well. Senator Pizzina, Senate Bill 266. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Lonzo. Please go ahead when you are ready. Good morning, Chair Dundero Loop, Vice Chair, our Majority Leader, Nicole Canazaro, and Finance Committee members. Once again, my name is Julie Pizzina, still representing the beautiful Senate District 12 in Clark County. And thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to present Senate Bill 266. Bre brief background on this one. Casinos and resorts frequently hold gaming contests and tournaments. Participants pay an entry fee. Currently, those entry fees are considered part of the gross revenue for a casino and so are included in the calculation of how much the casino must pay for its monthly license fee. The reason for exempting entry fees under these specific circumstances is that none of this money ever actually comes to the casino as income. It's either used in one of three buckets to pay employees as a donation or as prize money. Also, there has been an amendment added since the reprint that you have before you, and it should be included on Nellis as well, thanks to the absolutely phenomenal staff here of the Finance Committee. So while there's no dollar amount tied to local government fiscal notes, this would result in lost gaming, gross gaming tax, and we're trying to solve an unintended consequence really with this bill of taxing casinos for tournament entry fees where no casinos have actually generated any income. With that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Alonzo, and thank you so much. Please go ahead. And thank you, Senator Pazina and uh, Chair Dondara Loop, members of the committee for the record. I'm Michael Alonso. I'm here on behalf of Caesars Entertainment. And uh, Virginia Valentine is in Las Vegas on the video on behalf of the Nevada Resort Association. And SB 266 is, was requested by the Resort Association. Uh, I think Senator Pazina covered uh, the items that I wanted to cover, and I would just reiterate that prior to the 2019 legislative session, entry fees uh, for the right to enter into a contest and tournament were not taxable, and that's where this came from, is really, in our view, a clarification. Um, we did not oppose that bill and did not believe that the items that Senator Pazina brought out uh, were taxable, and we worked with the Gaming Control Board to solve this issue. As far as the fiscal impact, um, the the 3.4 million over the biennium, again for us, it's the none of the these taxes were being paid until um, after the 2019 legislative session, and it is a tiny amount of the percentage fee collected on gaming and. Uh, tournaments and contests, uh, I'll just uh, mention this in 2019, the reason the Gaming Control Board came to us is because they saw the growth in those tournaments and contests and thought they should be taxable and we ended up agreeing with that. And I think that growth will continue to go uh, forward and the state will continue to benefit from that growth and I think this, this bill helps to incentivize that additional growth. As far as the amendment is concerned, um, I'm going to turn that over to Doug Billings, who was with uh, Boyd Law School, and this was part of the uh, Boyd Law School bill in the form of SB 379. It made it through committee and uh, ultimately did not get through uh, the Senate floor, and I will turn it over to him on this amendment. Please go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Dondera Loop, members of the committee. Uh, as Mr. Alonzo said, we, we uh, use, we use state oh, I'm sorry. Here. That's okay. That, that, that's the one thing I didn't put in my notes. Uh, Doug Billings, B I L L I N G S. Uh, as Mr. Alonzo noted, I'm going to address section 1.5 of the amendment to section 266, which is a which is an effort to modernize Nevada's foreign gaming statutes. Uh, the foreign gaming revisions, as he mentioned, were originally one of three parts of the UNLV Boyd School of Law bill, which was SB 379. 
Uh, I was a Masters of Gaming Law student at UNLV and enrolled in the Gaming Policy class that developed the proposals that uh, ultimately were contained in SB 379. That bill did pass through the Senate Judiciary Committee, but there was a portion of that bill that uh, received some stiff opposition from both the Gaming Control Board and some members of industry. Ultimately, the bill never received a floor vote. So unfortunately, the proposed revisions to the foreign gaming statutes also died, uh, even though there had been no opposition to those provisions, and in fact, they had received broad support. Uh, so section 1.5 of the proposed amendment uh, before you today would revive, would, would revive the foreign gaming provisions that were contained in SB 379 and would therefore effectively salvage a portion of the UNLV law school bill. Uh, with regard to the substance, real quickly, the, the foreign gaming statutes apply to any Nevada gaming licensee who participates in, in the conduct of business or gaming business outside the state of Nevada. That includes both casino operators and manufacturers. Uh, the statute has been in its current form since the early 1990s and it requires a licensee to submit a series of annual and quarterly reports. Uh, as you know, gaming has exploded since the early 1990s. Some Nevada licensees are now, uh, are now operating in hundreds of jurisdictions and thousands of indi individual locations, which of course has, re has uh, resulted in a substantial burden in the reporting obligations that they have under the, under the current law. Uh, not only do they have a substantial burden, but the Gaming Control Board has to collect and review and analyze that information, even though much of it has, has uh, really of limited utility. So the original, the, bill, the original version of SB 379 was somewhat limited, but after the bill introduction, I engaged in conversations with stakeholders, including the Gaming Control Board, uh, and learned that there was a universal appetite to change the bill to, to make it broader than it had originally been. Uh, as a result of that, we introduced an amendment to SB 379 that was adopted in committee uh, before the bill died. And that is effectively, uh, I think, substantively the same as the amendment that you have before you today. Uh, the amendment is fairly simple. It just eliminates some reporting requirements that have been imposed and reduces the frequency of others. Uh, this will result in, a, in regulatory relief not only to the industry, but will continue to provide the Gaming Control Board the information that they have indicated that they want and need in order to oversee the foreign gaming operations of their licensees. Thank you very much for that explanation. Is there, are there any questions from the committee? Any comments? Senator Canizaro. Da, 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 da. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you mentioned that this amendment that I am actually looking at, which does um, change some of the reporting requirements. What is, I mean, what is the effect of that and what is the purpose of having fewer reporting requirements and less frequently? Doug Billings, for the record. Uh, the, what has happened over the last, third, well, really this provision goes back 50 years and they changed the rules in the early 90s to make it reporting requirements. But because of the, because of the expansive, um, the expansion of gaming across the globe, licensees are now everywhere. And, and as I said, in hundreds of jurisdictions and thousands of locations, and, and it has become quite a burden. Um, the Gaming Control Board, in fact, has, has they have developed a policy that, that collects information that is actually different than what is in the current statute. Uh, that has been going on for at least several years and probably up to 20 years. They're, really what they've been collecting is somewhat different than what the statute currently requires. Uh, in our conversations with, with them though, even what they are collecting now, uh, we learned is more than, than what they really need and what they wanted to collect. So this was a, an effort working with, with them and with, with the industry stakeholders to, to f get to a point where the information is, is what the Gaming Control Board needs and wants, but also limits some of the burden because these are pretty substantial, especially for manufacturers. This is a, a really substantial burden. They had to report every quarter on thousands of individual locations that they had. Um, and that was information the Gaming Control Board uh, simply didn't need it with that frequency. So this, this cuts down on that frequency and eliminates other information that, that really hasn't been collected at any rate. So your testimony is that the Gaming Control Board has not been following what's in statute. And I don't, I guess I, you might have to explain that a little more. How I read this amendment is that you're actually striking, you mentioned quarterly reports and things like that. These are annual, 
Language is being stricken annual operational and regulatory reports describing compliance with regulations, procedures for audit, and procedures for surveillance relating to foreign gaming operations is one part of it. So that's not quarterly, that's annual. Um, and then documents filed by a licensee or an affiliate with the foreign jurisdiction. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to square the language that's in the amendment with what, you're, what you just answered my question with. Sure. Thank you again, Doug Billings, for the record. I think that the, and certainly if I if I uh, stated that the Gaming Control Board is not uh, is not complying with the statute, that was not that was not my intention. Uh, they are they are collecting the information, but um, but what they're actually using, to my understanding, and this is based on my conversations with with staff at the Gaming Control Board, so um, uh, others could answer this question better, I think, but. Um, is that they are, that the information that's actually being provided to them um, is not information that is particularly useful to them at this point. And that includes the part that's, that's stricken out there. Um, and it includes, uh, again, quarterly reports that, that uh, simply don't need to be provided that often, so. Uh, because I think, I think, if I may, for just a moment, because I think there was some reference to, well, a lot of reference to a bill that didn't make it. I think there are some concerns over whether when we are talking about reducing reporting or removing requirements for that, um, you know, we tend to have some scrutiny that comes along with that, right? Because we want to make sure that we're doing things in an appropriate fashion and in the way that I think um, Nevada does it better than any other state or any other place in the world. Um, and so I think it would be helpful, and I don't know, you know, Mr. Alonzo, you're going to pipe in, and so I'll, I'll let you as well. Uh, but it might also be helpful to then hear from if there's anybody from the Gaming Control Board who can talk to us about what exactly it is that you're collecting that you're not using that's not helpful and how this all kind of interplays with that so that we have a better idea of exactly what it is this bill is trying to do in this, in this particular portion of the amendment. The rest of the bill I don't have questions on, but this part I, I just had a few questions. So if there's anything you want to add, Mr. Alonzo, otherwise, um, and we can always follow up after this as well. I don't want to take too much of the committee's time. And Madam Chair, uh, again for the record, Michael Alonzo and to the Majority Leader, the, the issue in, uh, from the operator standpoint, also from the manufacturer standpoint, I think that in the, in the gaming control board, it's, it, it is something that they've worked through over a very long period of time on how to address this. And if you look at that subsection two and what's been stricken out, it's the, what's the burdensome part is the operational regulatory reports describing compliance with regulations, procedures for audit, procedures for surveillance, relating to the foreign gaming operations. So if you think about what that state requires in terms of the actual uh, internal control procedures, for example, which could be 500 pages long, or the uh, audit procedures that Nevada's are very long, right? And those other states would have something similar, procedures for surveillance. And that's what the licensees then have to attach to these reports, these gigantic procedures that the Gaming Control Board can request if they want at any time. Many of these companies are publicly traded companies and have to report all the time anyways and have Gaming Control Board agents monitoring them from the Port Corporate Securities Division. So it's changed a lot since the foreign gaming statute was first put in place. And so I don't think it's anything that the Gaming Control Board isn't able to access. It's just the requirement in the statute that those things be provided on an annual basis, and they're just, I think, more significant now because of the amount and number of companies that are out there that have to do the reporting. I don't think, and I don't think see anybody from the Gaming Control Board, but um, I believe that they would say that they agree with this from the standpoint of just trying to streamline it, but it's not something that they can't otherwise request. So, 
Senator Ganser, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And when you look at highly regulated industries, there's standards, and you're talking about like standards from states to state. So I can understand why you don't necessarily want um, an annual report of procedures, right? You've got compliance with regulations and you've got procedures for audit, procedures for surveillance. But another thought would be that they have to provide them if there's a change in any of those. So right now you're just eliminating it. So it's, un it's my understanding that the Gaming Control Board can request them if they need them. An uh, another way to approach it potentially is if there's any changes, because a lot of times there's not changes for years and years and years. It, you know, it depends on what happens in, in the other jurisdiction. Just a thought, thank you. And Madam Chair, uh, to Senator Ganser, I don't think we have a, a concern with if there are changes, but it, it is what you said. The Gaming Control Board has other mechanisms through their licensing and the registration of public companies or intermediary companies to request that information anytime that they need it. Um, it's just that the statute requires it to be filed with the annual report, and that's the issue we're trying to deal with because it's significant amount of information they can otherwise get if they want to request it. And if, if I may quickly, Doug Billings for the record, uh, just to point out that the, the amendment does provide uh, that the Gaming Control Board can require such other information as the Commission requires by regulation. So they do have the ability, even under the statute, specifically to require additional information. Uh, and I would also point out to Senator Canizaro to one, one point you made, the um, Nevada is the only state that currently requires this type of information based on our research. Uh, no other state requires foreign gaming reports from its gaming licensees, and so this would still uh, remain, although, although modified, it would still remain by far the most ambitious uh, uh, regulation of foreign gaming in the country. Any additional questions or comments from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. We will go to support on Senate Bill 266 uh, here in Carson City in Las Vegas. Um, Ms. Valentine, would you like to speak? Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Virginia Valentine, for the record representing the Nevada Resort Association. We're here to testify in support of SB 266. I want to thank the, uh, the bill sponsor, Senator Pizzina, all the sponsors on the bill, and uh, ask for your support on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any additional support in Las Vegas? Seeing none, we'll go to the phone lines. BPS, when you're ready. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Anyone in opposition for Senate Bill 266, Carson City, Las Vegas? And on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. And we will go to neutral here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, and on the phone lines, please. BPS, when you're ready. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you very much. And with that, any closing remarks? Thank you, Senator Pazina. And with that, I'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 266, and I will open the hearing on Senate Bill 234. Thank you, Senator Scheibel, for your patience. And please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's okay, I got a lot done sitting there on my phone. Uh, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I'm the State Senator for District 9. Very pleased to be in front of you today uh, presenting SB 234. This is a bill that I co-presented in the Senate Judiciary Committee with Max Greenstein, who is a youth legislator and is um, more eloquent and was better prepared than I was for that hearing, and he probably is in most of his life. Um, and the purpose of SB 234 is to um, upkeep family connections for people who are incarcerated and to allow them to be able to speak to um, their family members, in particular their children, um, without an additional cost to them. This bill has been through a couple of different iterations and so the current language that you see before you is, is the 
finalized language, which would establish a pilot program at Florence McClure, which is our women's facility, and um, it would give every person there a free 15-minute phone call each day um, so that they have the opportunity without having to put money on their books or anything like that to speak to members of their family, particularly their children, but it could also be siblings, spouses, people like that, those support systems that they have outside of the uh, incarceration facility so that when they do return to our community um, outside of a prison or, or incarceration, they are better prepared and better connected to those around them so that they can return to work and school and family life and be productive, helpful, and happy members of our, our our society. I have with me Director Zarenda from the Department of Corrections. Um, there is no fiscal note on this bill, and um, I think that he can confirm that there's no financial impact. So James Zarenda, for the record, uh, Department of Corrections Director. Uh, there is no fiscal impact. I've already uh, started the uh, contract talk with uh, Securus, uh, communications who actually oversees our telecommunications and there's gonna be no fiscal impact to do the pilot program at uh, Florence McClure uh, for six months. Uh, that will allow every offender that's at Florence McClure a free phone call for 15 minutes every single day uh, for that six month period uh, to help that communication with their support and their families, which everyone knows is important. Thank you so much. Any questions, Senator Gokachia? Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Director Zarenda. Uh, how do you envision this? Are you gonna take the, uh, the inmate to the phone or take the phone to the inmate? James Zarenda, for the record, so it, it will be the same process that's done in place today where the phones are on the walls inside the housing units. They'll just be given access to the first time they use the phone during the day or evening, their very first phone call, the first 15 minutes will be free on the phone wall. Uh, if I may, Madam Chair, but then if they talk 30 minutes, you will be billing them for the other 15. James Renner, for the record, what I was told by uh, Securus, anything 16 minutes or after, they will be billed for. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, any additional comments or questions? All right, seeing none, um, thank you for bringing this bill forward. And we'll go to support here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, in Las Vegas and on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go to opposition here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll go to neutral in Carson City, in Las Vegas, and on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, thank you very much. With that, closing comments, Senator Scheibel. All right, with that, I'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 234. And with that, if you'll give me just a one minute recess, uh, we'll be back. Okay, we're back. Um, we will do uh, public, our next item agenda is public comment. So if anybody is here in Carson City for public comment, please go ahead. 
If not, we'll go to Las Vegas. Uh, good morning, Ms. Carrion. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Victoria Carrion, for the record, I'm the administrator at the Division of Industrial Relations, and I apologize. I was trying to testify on SB 274 over the phone while en route to Grant Sawyer Building, and I could not get through on the phone line. So I don't know if it's appropriate to make any comments at this time or if you'd like us to submit something in writing later. Please go ahead. We Please are fairly ahead. flexible, okay. so go ahead. So okay. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Victoria Carrion, for the record again. Um, so SB 274, as you heard from Senator daily addresses benefit penalties in workers' compensation cases. So our agency is the one that is responsible for um, doing those benefit penalty complaints and conducting those investigations. We do believe there would be a fiscal impact and that there would be an increase in benefit penalty complaints of about 50 annually. Uh, we currently have two staff members who full-time process these benefit penalty complaints and do these investigations. We currently have a backlog, so there isn't really any capacity for those staff people to do any additional investigations. So as part of the fiscal note, we did ask for one additional compliance audit investigator three position. And then there's also a technology impact where we would have to put some information up on our website showing what benefit penalties had been decided. And so there is a also a technology cost. So thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we're sorry you had any issue. Thank you for being with us today. All right, any additional public comment there in Carson, in Las Vegas? Seeing none, uh, BPS, is there anybody on the phones for public comment, please? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much and thank you for your help. All right, with that, um, we are going to recess this meeting with no promises, but we are going to recess for right now and uh, we're moving quickly in the next uh, few weeks. So stay tuned and be on your toes and be aware that we may uh, call a meeting later today. So thank you very much and we'll recess as of now. Thank you.